This is going to be Matthew chapter 10. And we're going to talk about seven epic characteristics of our captain. And Hebrews 2.10 shows us that the Lord Jesus Christ is the captain of our salvation. And he has so many characteristics that show just how amazing he is. So we're going to talk about seven of those. The first one is his power. In Matthew 10, 1, when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. So the Lord gave them power, power against unclean spirits. So even the unclean spirits were no match for the disciples for the most part. If you're a born-again believer, then you have something the disciples didn't even have because the Lord has also given you power. Even more power, honestly. Because in he, uh, Ephesians 6, 10 through 11, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You see, the whole armor of God is put into your spiritual locker room the moment you get saved. You just got to go in there and put it on. But the Lord is the God who has infinite power power that can light the creation without the sun. In Revelation 22, 5, it says, And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. The Lord is so powerful, he can give light to the entire creation with no need of the sun. And he lives in you. So you've got power. And any power you have comes from the Savior. So the Lord gave these 12 disciples power to cast out the unclean spirits. And in Matthew 8, 26, the Lord cast out the spirits with his word. So your best bet to get the devils to move out is to put the words of God in you. And obviously the devils can't possess your soul, but they can possess your flesh. So the more words you're putting in, the more devils that are going to be cast off from your flesh. In Psalm 119, 11, it says, Thy word have I hidden mine heart that I might not sin against thee. If devils try to get in your flesh, you'll have the word of God hidden in you, and it'll jump out and scare the devils away. The Lord also gives the disciples power to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. So there could have been no danger of a planned demic back then. The disciples and Jesus would have healed all the corona patients. And that plan would have backfired. But all these things they did were signs. All these casting out devils and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease were simply signs to unbelieving Jews. As 1 Corinthians one twenty two says, the Jews require a sign. So God gave his power to some faithful men that would be his disciples. And the Lord prayed all night before choosing the disciples. As it talks about in Luke 6, 12 through 13, where it says, And it came to pass on those days that we, he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And then when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. So, he prayed before he called the disciples. But another amazing characteristic of our captain, we talked about his power, but what about his posse? You can tell a lot about a man by the men who follow him. He had a real posse. In Matthew 10, 2 through 4, it says, Now the names of the twelve apostles are these, the first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, and Labaius, whose surname is Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. So Simon, who is called Peter. And I've heard that Simon means shifting sand, but I've also heard it means to hear or obey. And his name Peter means a rock. And Peter is a rough fisherman. He is a real character. And before you got saved, you were sinking in the sand. And now you're standing on a rock. So it. So these names of the apostles 
I want to look at those and use those as kind of little illustrations of what a disciple should be, you know. Before you were sh uh, on sand, now you're standing on a rock, and the rock isn't Peter. The rock is our captain, the Lord Jesus Christ. But it shows a lot about our captain because he got a rough neck like Peter to look up to him. If a rough guy like Peter looks up to you, then you must be a rough character. I think the Lord was. And then Andrew, his brother. And Andrew's name means strong, manly. That's a cool name. The Lord is looking for some manly men who will be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. There should be something in every man that wants to be manly. But today, you've got kind of this effeminate spirit going on where the world wants the men to be effeminate and the women to be manly and have a role reversal and make things backwards. You see, the devil loves to do things backwards. You know, he likes for you to spin the CDs, the records backwards. He likes for the role of the home to be backwards. He likes to call evil good and good evil. He likes things twisted. James. Now, this is John's brother. James comes from the Hebrew name Jacob, which means schemer, supplanter. And there's another disciple named James, the son of Alphaeus. And there's also another James referred to as James the Less in Mark 15, 40, and that's the Lord's brother, James. So there's several James in the Bible. And then you got John. John means God is gracious. And by grace are you saved through faith. A good disciple won't forget the grace of God. Then you got Philip, which means warlike or lover of horses. That's a cool name. The Lord is a man of war. He's warlike. He's coming back on a white horse. He's a lover of horses. And he's got ten thousands of his saints on white horses as well. So I hope you're a lover of horses. A disciple needs to be warlike and war a good warfare as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Then you have Bartholomew. And this name means having many furrows. A furrow is a trench in the earth made by a plow. You see, a good disciple needs to stay digging in the word. Now, Thomas means twin. And one day I'm going to get a glorified body and I'm going to be like him, the Lord. A good disciple will try to be just like his captain all the way up until our vile body is fashioned like unto his glorified body. You know, you want to be his twin, right? You want to be just like the Lord. Matthew means gift of God. His other name, Levi, means joined or united. And a good disciple will never forget the gift of God, the salvation of Jesus Christ that caused him to be united with the Father, you know, reconciled to the Father and joined with the body of Christ. Labaius meaning man of heart. This disciple's name, Labaius, means man of heart. And his uh, surname or additional name is Thaddeus. But he's also named Judas as well in Luke 6.16 6, and John 14.22. He's the Judas who's not Iscariot. Uh, but you see, his name Labaius means man of heart. And a good disciple will let the hidden man of the heart, the Lord Jesus Christ, lead him. Then you got another disciple named Simon there, Simon the Canaanite, and you got a, a Judas Iscariot. And Judas means praise. Judas Iscariot is a devil, according to John 6.70. He's a traitor, according to Luke 6.16, and a betrayer, according to Matthew 26.14 through 16. And what you can learn from him is don't pretend to be something that you're not. His name means praise, but it has to be a fake praise because Judas is a devil. In Matthew 10, 5, it says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter you not. The Samaritans were half Jew and half Gentile. 
And he says in verse 6, But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Notice that their first and foremost primary ministry was to the Jews, whereas Paul's primary ministry was to Gentiles. As he says in Romans 15, 16, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. You see, in, uh, in the Gospels, the Lord has given the Jews another shot. He's given them a shot at the kingdom. And they're going to reject him three times. They're going to reject John the Baptist. That's strike one. They're going to reject Jesus Christ. That's strike two. And then when they reject the message of Stephen in Acts 7, that's strike three. And then he goes, the Lord will go to the Gentiles and raise up Paul, who's going to be the minister to the Gentiles. But right now, in this that we're reading, the Lord's going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's his primary focus. And in Matthew 15, 24, it says, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So that's the focus. And he tells them in Matthew 10, 7, and as ye go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, the kingdom of heaven refers to the physical kingdom on this earth. You see, if the Jews, they were going to, if they would have accepted Jesus Christ instead of rejecting him, then they were going to get the kingdom, as I just said. But they rejected him. So the church age we are in today started. The church age is like a, a, parent, a parenthetical time period. It's a, it's a God postponed giving the Jews the kingdom and put the church age in. The church age would have never happened if the Jews would have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah. The kingdom would have already been here. But since the Jews rejected Jesus Christ, the kingdom was postponed and God brought in the church age that we're currently in. And in this age we are in, the Jews are temporarily blind in part to the gospel. But the Lord, he's telling these disciples here in Matthew 10, 8, to go out and heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. And he's telling them to do this because why? 1 Corinthians 1, 22 the Jews require a sign. He's offering them the kingdom. He wants to confirm the words that are being preached with signs. He wants them to believe. But notice that this healing is free. It says, freely you have received, freely give. Nobody's passing out the KFC buckets around for them to put money in to be healed or to have their devil cast out. You know, a man that, that gets a devil pass, uh, cast out of him, he doesn't have to worry about getting repossessed for not paying the healing bill that month. You know, it's freely received, and he wants them to freely receive, freely give. But men claim to be able to do all these things today, all these signs of an apostle. But they don't realize that the purpose of God giving the disciples these sign gifts was not to prove their spirituality, not to make a living, not to assure their own salvation. It was to confirm the word. The signs accompanied the message so that people would believe the disciples and their message was the real deal. That's why it says in Mark 16, 20, and they went forth and preached everywhere. You see, the preaching comes first. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. So they would go around, preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand, then heal somebody, cast out a devil, cleanse a leper, or raise from somebody from the dead, and the people would know they were legit after those signs. He says in uh, Matthew 10, 9, Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. So he wants to, the disciples to leave their man purses at home. You know, leave all that gold and silver and brass at the house. He says in verse 10, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. So they're not pulling up to people's houses in a limo or private jets with shiny suits on. The Lord basically told them to bring nothing and what they, whatever they needed, they could earn it on the journey. The Lord would make sure that they had it. He says in verse 11, Into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. Worthy to hear the message. If they will hear the message, then abide there. You see, the ones who hear and receive the message are the ones 
who would supply the disciples with what they needed, with the coats and the shoes and the, all the other things that they need. Because the workman is worthy of his meat. You see, God will... Uh, he know, God knows that there'll be some people there who will supply them with what they need. He says in Matthew ten twelve through 13, And when you come into a an house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your, house, let your peace return to you. You see, don't bid them peace if they won't receive a message from God. Just like you wouldn't bid God speed to a false teacher giving the wrong message as it talks about in 2 John 1, 10 through 11. So if somebody's giving you the wrong message, you're not going to bid them Godspeed. And if they won't receive the, the message from God, you're not going to bid them peace either. Matthew ten fourteen And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, Shake off the dust of your feet. So if someone won't receive the gospel from you, then just shake it off and go on to the next person who will. But that's the disciples, and they're a rough group. That's a rough bunch of men, and that tells you a lot about our captain because of his posse. So we've seen his power, his posse. Now we'll see his punishments. The captain doesn't leave sin unpunished. He is the original punisher. In Matthew ten fifteen, it says, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. You know, that city that, re, uh, that rejects the message of the disciples. The Lord says it's going to be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for them. And that's because... You know, Sodom and Gomorrah wouldn't have had that much truth coming to them. And he he's pretty much saying, you know, if Sodom and Gomorrah was here during this time and they had the disciples come to them, they would have probably repented. But these cities aren't. And this also shows us that there will be different degrees of punishment. Because he says it's going to be more tolerable for some people than for other people. And in Revelation 20, 13, it says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. So they're judged by their works to determine how bad the lake of fire will be for that individual person. So there's different degrees of punishment. In Matthew twenty three fifteen, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye can pass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. So not only is there different degrees of punishment, that's because there's different degrees of evil. There's going to be people who are more evil, so therefore they're going to get twofold more punishment. Someone who is twofold or double the hellraiser is going to get back double in eternity. Would it be just for an honest, hardworking family man who was overall a good man according to worldly standards, but yet he never got saved? Would it be just for that man to get as much torture in the lake of fire as the Pope? No, absolutely not. The Pope would get it twofold or worse than the regular average Joe, good old boy, lost man that you run into every day. You see, there's different degrees of evil. So for it to be just, there has to be different degrees of punishment. In Deuteronomy 32, 22, it says, For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. You see, the further you go down may be a worse degree of punishment. In Psalm 86, 13, it says, For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul, from the lowest hell. So, there's lower, there's the lowest hell. That could be a different degree of punishment. In Matthew ten fifteen, the Lord says, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. It would be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah, a place that was burnt to a crisp for sexual perversion, 
It would be more tolerable for them than for a city who rejects the message of the disciples. So rejecting the truth of God is just as bad or more serious of a sin than sodomy. But the captain's punishments are beyond our comprehension. He has a place where there is a fire that can never be put out. And this is a place where he has the keys. He has the keys of hell and of death. That's his punishments. The next thing we see about our captain is his persecution tolerance. It shows you what kind of captain we have when you consider the persecution he could endure. He left heaven. He came down, walked among the wolves, the lions, the evil beasts of the earth. In Matthew ten sixteen, he's telling the disciples, his posse, he says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You see, God's people are like sheep because he's the chief shepherd. And when you walk in the midst of wolves, you shouldn't fear any evil because his rod and his staff will comfort you. Not only will his rod and his staff keep you safe from the wolves, but the rod will keep you from straying off the path. While you're on the journey, you need to be wise as serpents. The serpent of Genesis 3 is wiser than Daniel. But the thing about him is he's not harmless as a dove. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You see, the serpent is very good about being patient. The serpent is very good at catching its prey. So you, as a disciple, you need to have the serpent's wisdom, but be harmless. You see, Jesus became the serpent on a pole. In that sense, he's the king's snake. But unlike the devil, he's harmless. In uh, Hebrews 7, 26, For such an high priest became us who was home, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. You see, as the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world, he's harmless. But one day he's coming back as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And that's when he's going to kill all these snakes out there that ain't harmless. But you... You can be wise as a serpent in your witnessing. Putting out the bait. But staying harmless. Not forcing anybody to do anything that they don't want to do from the heart. You see. You're not coming in and trying to establish the kingdom of God. The spiritual kingdom by force. You want people to enter the kingdom of God willingly. He says in Matthew ten seventeen, But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they shall scourge you in their synagogues. So he says, Beware of men. You see, the Bible is a book of making you aware of things. In Matthew sixteen six, it says, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. In Mark twelve thirty eight, it says, Beware of the scribes. In Luke twelve fifteen, it says, Beware of covetousness. In Colossians two eight, it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. In Second Peter three seventeen, it says, Beware lest ye also, being led away with the air of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. You know how people have signs that say, Beware of dog at their house. Some places need signs that say. Beware of men. That's what the Lord said. He said, beware of men. Paul said in Philippians 3, 2, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. So don't fear man, but beware of man. If you're a godly person, there will be men who hate you. In 2 Timothy three twelve, it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. In an atmosphere where killing saints is the norm, you really want to be wise as serpents, blending in, striking at the right moment, going undetected. In Matthew ten eighteen, it says, And you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake. For a testimony against the gen against them and the Gentiles. He, the Lord said, for my sake, you'll be brought before governors and kings. To be brought before men to be persecuted, slandered, false accused, tormented, made fun of, hunted, killed, or to suffer in any way 
for the king's sake, for the captain's sake, will only result in good things. In Matthew nineteen twenty nine, it says, And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Matthew 24, 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Look what Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 14. If you be, if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Look what they say in Acts 5, 41. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. They rejoiced for the opportunity to suffer shame for the name of Jesus Christ. So it's worth it. And in Matthew ten nineteen, the Lord says, But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. And now this verse has nothing to do with not preparing a Sunday school lesson or preaching a sermon. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't prepare to teach or preach. I know pastors who will not prepare a lesson or sermon all week long because of this verse. They wait until someone's singing a solo on Sunday morning, and then they open their Bible and begin to find a message. And their proof text for doing that is here in Matthew 10. But that's not what this is about. The context is about when the disciples are delivered up to the councils, that they should take no thought how or what they shall speak, the Lord's going to give them the words. The context is that when the disciples testify before councils, that the Lord will give them the words to say. And it says in Matthew 10, 20, For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. You see, the Holy Spirit was in them before the cross, but the thing is it didn't seal them as it does today. Matthew ten twenty one, and the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. There will be times when persecution is so heavy that a person will sell out their own family member to stay alive. And in the tribulation, there will be brothers snitching on brothers who haven't taken the mark, and families will just be against each other during times like this. Matthew ten twenty two, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. First John three thirteen says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. John fifteen eighteen through nineteen says, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hateth you. So you see all these verses about the world's going to hate you if you're living like Jesus Christ, the person who was the greatest ever at enduring persecution. In Matthew ten twenty two, it says, And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Now, what is the end? Well, the end prophetically is the end of the tribulation and start of the second coming. A man will have to endure to the end of that time without taking the mark or die as a martyr. And we know the end refers to the end of the tribulation time period and when Jesus comes back at the second coming because of the very next verse. It talks about the Lord coming back. Look at Matthew ten twenty three. It says, But when they persecute you in this city... Flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, Ye shall have not gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. So you see, right there in the context, it talks about the end, and then it talks about the Lord coming. So you see that? Where it says, But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. You see, nothing wrong with fleeing. There are times to flee. In 2 Timothy 2.22, it says to flee youthful lusts. In 1 Corinthians 10.14, it says to flee from idolatry. In 1 Corinthians 6.18, it says to flee fornication. And when persecution, persecution comes, 
evade being captured if you can and go somewhere else to proclaim the gospel. In Matthew 10, 24, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. Jesus is the master and you are the servant. Obviously, he's above you, so don't expect to get better treatment than he received. And what did he receive? Persecution. Verse 25, it is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house, Bilzy Bub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Jesus is the master, and the disciples and us are the servants. If they're calling him the master, our captain, Beelzebub, then what do you think they're going to call me and you? We are the ones of his household. The master was persecuted. You're not above your master, so you will also face persecution. We should never compromise the message to keep from being persecuted. However, at the same time, you don't have to go directly into the into the persecution on a suicide mission the persecution will come to you if you keep doing right and proclaiming the right things just be aware that trouble is coming and be watchful as you proclaim the gospel he says in verse 26 fear not fear them not therefore for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known you see all these things men do in the dark and secretly are going to come out in the open all the agendas to get rid of God in the Bible will be revealed at the great white throne judgment. So that's the captain's persecution. He's the greatest at enduring persecution. And next we see his protection. In Matthew ten twenty seven, it says, What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. Don't be afraid to speak in light what he's told you don't be afraid to get up on the housetops and proclaim what he's told you don't be afraid to proclaim the offensive things in the scriptures because man cannot kill your soul they can only kill the body and when the soul leaves your body you're with the lord as paul says in second corinthians 5 8 we are confident i say and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the lord and matthew 10 28 he says and fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Man can't touch your soul. God has power over both soul and body. And a man that won't believe on Jesus Christ will have his body placed in the grave and his soul will go to hell fire. He says in verse 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? You see, if God is in charge of the sparrows, don't you think he will be in charge of the things coming your way? The one who is in charge of you has the keys of hell and of death. So there's no need to fear. In Matthew 10.30, it says, But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. And that's an amazing verse. God knows the number of the hairs on every person's head. And in Psalm 147.4, it says, He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. That means he, he can count the stars. Uh, your God knows how many hairs is on the head of every man alive. He knows how many stars is in the universe. Do you think he doesn't have your life covered? There's no reason to fear. So he says in verse 31, Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. You see, God knows every time a sparrow falls to the ground, and you are of much more value to him than this sparrow. Uh, God doesn't believe that animals have the same rights as people, especially the saints. Uh, God kill, cares way more for the people. Why well, do you think he gave Adam dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air back in Genesis 128? It says in Matthew 10.32, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Once again, what's the context? Someone being delivered in front of men. They're about to be beaten or about to be martyred or persecuted in some way. Uh, do you have it in you to confess Jesus Christ to a bunch of people who are about to kill you? There will be tribulation saints who refuse the mark and worshiping the Antichrist, and they will confess to be a worshiper of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're going to be killed for it. For me and you today in this country, we need to make sure our profession isn't just to other Christians at the local church but also to the lost world, no matter what happens, no matter what they say. We need to be able to confess 
before men. Matthew 10, 33, But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Well, if a tribulation saint denies the Lord, takes the mark, and worships the beast, then he seals his fate. Christians today need to confess the Lord and suffer for his name because our reign, not our salvation, but our reign in the millennium depends on it. And a lot of people think, well, if they denied the Lord once in their life, then they're done for. That's not true. Look at Peter. He denied him three times in the same night. Peter's in heaven. And it says in 2 Timothy 2.12, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. And the context there is denying us reign. If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he's going to de deny us reign. We'll still go to the kingdom. We're not going to hell. But if we deny him here, then we lose that reign. But he's going to protect you. That's what those verses are about, his protection. I mean, you're of more value than many sparrows. Your God has the keys of hell and death. Your God can count the stars. Your God knows how many hairs is on your head. Do you think that he can't protect you? That's your captain. And then the next thing, his plan to take over. Another epic characteristic about the Savior, our captain, is his plan to take over. He says in Matthew 10, 34, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. He's coming to take over with a sword and by force. And he won't do it through negotiations. He's not going to do it through peace talks. The kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom that he's going to take by force. It says in Matthew eleven twelve, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. You see, he came not to bring peace but a sword. That's his plan to take over. When he comes back, he's coming with a sharp two-edged sword. The first time he came as a lamb to die for the sins of the world, the second time he comes as the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he's going to have a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And see, he knows that he will divide people. Since the beginning, he divided the light from the darkness in Genesis 4. I mean, in Hebrews 4.12, it says he, the sword he got is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. For the word, it says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. But it's piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit. He's a divider, and the kingdom of Jesus Christ will not be brought in by peace, but by war. That's his plan to take over, is by war. He didn't come to get people of all religions together. He came with the message of, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And with a message like that, he knew he would be dividing some people. You see, it's an absolute way. People don't like a absolute way. They, they want to go anyway. He came preaching this narrow way in Matthew seven fourteen, and people didn't like it. It says in verse 35, For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Well, that wouldn't be too hard, that last one. But he didn't come to make you hate your in-laws. He didn't come to make you unable to live peaceably with them. But if you receive his message, then your beliefs are going to make you at variance at variance against your family many times, meaning y'all ain't going to agree. It says in verse 36, And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. You see, a man can get saved and his wife remain lost and they become enemies because he wants to live for God and she doesn't. And most times it's a saved wife with a lost husband. But she has, she has to remember she needs to stick it out with him anyway. It says in 1 Corinthians 7, 13, And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Just stick it out with him. And then more advice in 1 Peter 3, 1 through 2 says, Likewise ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. You see, she can win him over. But it, back in Matthew ten thirty seven it says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. 
And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You see, this verse interprets Luke fourteen twenty six for us, which is a very hard verse for a lot of people. And Luke fourteen twenty six it says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. See, this verse has caused a lot of people to write off the Bible. They think that the Lord's saying that you got to hate your parents and your brother and your sister and your in-laws. You know, hate as in not like them, want them dead type of hate. But if you read Luke fourteen twenty six in light of Matthew ten thirty seven, then it shows you that the Bible can use the word hate in the sense of loving someone less. In Matthew ten thirty seven, it says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. It's not that he doesn't want you to love them, he just doesn't want you to love them more than you do him. And that's why it says, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and so on. There he's not saying that he wants you to hate them. The Bible is using the word hate in the sense of you need to love them less than you do the Lord. And if you love your father or mother more than the Lord, then it says you're not worthy of them. So you need to hate your father or mother in the sense of loving them less, not in the sense of wanting them dead type of hate. And... Um, you see, the problem with loving them more is, if you love them more, then if they believe wrong and they're trying to get you to do bad things, you're going to do what they want you to do over what God wants you to do. And in situations like in the tribulation, say that your whole family goes to get the mark and you love them so much that you're going to go right along with it many times. Or that's just one example. But in Matthew 10.38, it says, And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Your cross isn't the troubles, pains, and agonies that come along with this present life that you got from just living life. It's the troubles, pains, and agonies that go along with suffering for Jesus Christ in this present life. You need to take that cross and follow Jesus Christ. The Christian life should be a life of dying daily. You die daily. And you see, you want to die daily. That way you you know that when you get to the judgment seat of Christ that you, you're going to get everything that the Lord has for you possible. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, Paul, Paul says, I pr protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. It says in verse 39, He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. If you're going around simply concerned with this physical life, then you're going to lose it. You see, the Lord has a plan to take over. And when he takes over, he's setting up a kingdom. And if you did not lose this present life in the sense, give up the things that you love down here and set up treasures for over there, you're going to go in the kingdom empty-handed. But if you lose the joys of this physical life to suffer for Jesus Christ, then you're going to find life, you're going to find rewards, you're going to find reign in the coming kingdom. He's got a plan to take over. And the last characteristic that we're going to talk about of the captain is his payoff. You see, there's going to be suffering down here, persecution down here, mockery down here. All that stuff is associated with being a true disciple. But the payoff at the end is all worth it. In Matthew 10.40, it says, He that receiveth you receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. If someone receives the disciples who are, going, who are going around confessing Jesus Christ before men, the person who receives them is basically also receiving the Lord themselves. In Matthew 10, 41, He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Now, this, isn't, this doesn't mean that you can just take in a saved person into your house and you're going to be saved too. That's not what is happening here. But it's given these examples here. You receive a prophet in the name of a prophet should receive a prophet's reward. A good example is the Shunammite woman gave Elijah a place to eat and sleep. 
she ended up being rewarded with a child in Second Kings 8, 4 through 17. You can read the story. She probably got a lot of flack for being associated with somebody like Elijah, but it was all worth it in the end. Rahab received a righteous man, and she got a righteous man's reward. She was told to let down a scarlet thread after she hid the righteous men in her home, and she was spared being destroyed along with the rest of Jericho. So, see, it pays off in the end. In Matthew 10, 42, it says, And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. So, just by giving a disciple of Jesus a cup of cold water, it is as, it's as if you gave it to Jesus Christ. And Jesus explains this at the judgment of the nations in Matthew twenty five thirty seven through 40. Uh, there's going to be a judgment of the nations when he comes back. And it says in Matthew twenty five thirty seven through 40, Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? And when, we, when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So when you do something good for a saint, it's like you're doing it for the Lord. When you mistreat a saint, it's like you're mistreating the Lord. As Paul, or as God said to Paul on the road to Damascus before he got saved, he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? You see, the good things you do for other Christians, you're doing that to the body of Christ. He sees that as you doing it for him. And that's an amazing thing if you really sit down and think about it. When you do something good for another Christian, Jesus considers you doing that for him. When you mistreat another Christian, he sees that as like you're doing that to the body. But this has been Matthew chapter 10, about seven epic characteristics of our captain.